my life went from trying not to jump off the fifth floor balcony of our flat, which was a real like serious mental uh, task for me for many years, trying not to commit suicide, to uh, researching and putting all my energy into this. I think this eradicates mental illness. And it really did for me. It really did um, literally eradicate the symptoms of bipolar disorder for me. What we did was a ketogenic uh, therapy in those with schizophrenia or bipolar for a four-month duration uh, pilot study. So this was all exploratory, and it was very promising. The vision I have for this is that someone has, you know, has an episode, and this is offered as standard of care. This is one of the options that is given. Treating mental health disorders with ketogenic therapy is, is a growing field, and for good reason. There's ongoing research showing safety and efficacy. There's growing clinical practice with physicians and, and other clinicians improving the lives of their patients, and there's individuals sharing their lived experience. And I was fortunate enough to moderate a discussion sort of covering all of these aspects. Um, and this is one of those episodes where it's like, I was in the right place at the right time. I'm so grateful to be here because this was in a beautiful resort on Coronado um, in San Diego. And it was for the eighth global symposium on ketogenic therapeutics, a whole conference dedicated to therapeutic ketosis. And this was a special dinner session that I was fortunate enough to moderate with with four amazing individuals to talk about the, the science, the clinical experience, the lived experience, of using ketogenic therapies to improve people's lives um, living with mental illness. So this is this is that symposium. This is that um, dinner discussion. And who we're going to hear from is one, Dr. Ian Campbell, one of the foremost researchers of ketogenic therapies for mental illness and someone who lives with bipolar disorder himself. So he, he sort of straddles all of these aspects of the research, the clinical care, and the lived experience. There's also Dr. Shivani Sethi, a psychiatrist at Stanford who completed one of the first trials of ketogenic therapy for mental illness and runs the metabolic psychiatry program at Stanford University. Again, both the research and the clinical treatment aspect of, of ketogenic therapies. And Nicole Laurent, a mental health counselor who really specializes in helping people with mental health disorders start and maintain ketogenic therapies to help treat their, their uh, psychiatric symptoms. And then finally, uh, MJ Lehman, uh, an individual who has his own lived experience. And I, I keep wanting to say was brave enough to, to share his story. But as in our other videos where you hear from Hannah Warren, it's not brave. It's, it, it, she doesn't want it to be brave. And, and maybe MJ is the same. But the, to share their personal experience um, of, of how they benefited from ketogenic therapy. So that's what this video is all about. It's this moderated discussion talking about ketogenic therapies from research to clinical practice to lived experience. It was so inspiring and rewarding to be there that, that I hope you get the same out of this. But please remember, Metabolic Mind is a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group. I'm Dr. Brett Schur, the director of Metabolic Mind, but this channel is for informational purposes only. We're not establishing a doctor-patient relationship or providing any group or individual medical or healthcare advice. Some of the interventions we talk about can be potentially dangerous if done without proper supervision. So please make sure you consult with your healthcare team before changing any medications or even changing your lifestyle to treat a medical intervention. So with that, I hope you really enjoy this discussion uh, from Coronado at the 8th Global Symposium on Ketogenic Therapeutics. Bazooki Group is a private family philanthropy located in the Bay Area. Um, Dave and Jan Bazuki founded the organization um, just a little over a couple of years ago. Actually, we're quite new. Their son, Matt, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder um, with psychosis when he was 19. He had a manic episode as a freshman in college, ended up hospitalized, and as those in the field of mental health know, for about five years, he struggled with dozens of different treatments, didn't find relief, was hospitalized multiple times for manic episodes, and after five years of that struggle, as Tenacious parents do, Jan kept looking for solutions, and she read about the use of the ketogenic diet in psychiatry. And so Matt started the ketogenic diet in January of 2021. And within four months, all his signs and symptoms of bipolar disorder had resolved. And so he has been well now since May of 2021. And so Dave and Jan had started 
contributing to science, supporting research in bipolar disorder in general. Again, having a child and not finding adequate solutions, they started investing in scientific research in bipolar to understand mechanisms. And then when Matt got well on the ketogenic diet, the focus really shifted to this is something that we need to learn more about. The world needs to learn more about. Obviously, in that journey, they had learned this is something that had been used in the epilepsy world for over 100 years. But in psychiatry, it was new. And so now, as a foundation, um, this is really our mission, is to advance the field of metabolic psychiatry. We have funded, we funded five pilot clinical trials last year in, for ketogenic diet and schizophrenia, major depression, and bipolar disorder. Um, two of our studies are represented up here tonight with Shabani, Sethi, and Ian Campbell. Um, Shabani, we're not going to be talking really about data tonight, but please come to the session on Wednesday. Shabani will be talking about the data from her pilot trial. And we're now funding some larger studies, um, getting more into mechanistic um, pieces of the ketogenic diet, as well as expanding. Uh, we have Dr. Guido Frank here, who's local here. We are funding a, a pilot trial in anorexia nervosa with ketogenic diet as well. And so we are just super excited to bring this work into the broader ketogenic diet world. Uh, and we would love to talk with you all later tonight, later this week, if you're interested in learning more about how this might fit into psychiatry, how this overlaps with what's going on in other fields. We are super excited to be here and to be supporting this work. And we thank you for coming. And I'm going to hand it over to Brett Schur, as the, who's my colleague at Bazooki Group and the director of Metabolic Mind. So while we do support research, our parallel initiative is to bring education and awareness to the public around the use of ketogenic therapies. Um, in your bag from the conference, there's a little postcard. And if you go to the Metabolic Mind website, uh, you'll see the links to our YouTube channel where Brett has done a ton of interviews with experts, with people with lived experience. It's core to our mission to integrate the experience of those who live with these disorders with the research that we are supporting. And so that's what we're here to do tonight. I'll hand it over to Brett. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as she said, I'm, I'm Brent Sher, I'm the director of Metabolic Mind. Um, I'm actually a cardiologist by training. And a lot of people at first are like, wait a second, what's a cardiologist doing in, in the mental health field? Because really, from cardiology, I became a metabolic health specialist. And my focus has been on metabolic health for about a decade now. And for a while, I was working to try and sort of forward metabolic health as an intervention for type 2 diabetes and just as become to allow physicians to become more aware of metabolic health. And then I met the bazookis and I heard their story and I saw the opportunity of helping people draw this connection between metabolic health and mental health and really trying to reframe how psychiatrists and how primary care doctors and how we look at mental health and mental illness and, and treatments for it. And as Julie really just outlined very well, the research that's being funded and being and really pushing forward a lot of this new knowledge. And then how do we connect that research to sort of the end goal? Like how do we help the Matt Bazookis of the world? How do we help the Jan and Dave Bazookis of the world? As Jan often says, you know, our goal at Metabolic Mind is to provide the resources that she wanted, that she could have used, so she didn't have to spend hundreds of hours just combing through everything available to try and find something to help her son. How can we provide those resources to make it so much easier? And part of that is, is really connecting with the individuals who can spread the word, spread the science, and really help forward this. And that is why I'm so thrilled to have this panel of experts with us today who really connect the dots between the lived experience, knowing what it's like to, to live with a psychiatric diagnosis, to live with those symptoms, and know what it's like to, to have treatments that maybe aren't as good as they could be, and then to find something that really works. But then how do we connect that back to the clinician, providing the care to the patients, and then even further to the research so that one informs the other that eventually gets down to helping the patients because that's what we really um, really want to focus on as our goal. So for that, I want to kick it to our panel to introduce themselves. And then after they introduce themselves, we'll get into a little 
discussion here and after which we'll open up to a Q&A for all of you. So let's start with you, Nicole, since I already cut you off once. No, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so my name's Nicole Laurent. I'm a licensed mental health counselor in Washington State. Um, and I use psychotherapy with ketogenic diets. I transition people coming in and uh, we learn to do ketogenic diets and then I get to do therapy with them. And it's a very powerful combination. Thank you, MJ. Hi there, I'm MJ Lehman. I'm from Chicago where I am a co-owner and CEO of a manufacturing company. I'm also on the board of DBSA, which is a, a national nonprofit that focuses on uh, mood disorder. So I'm not an expert, but I have lived with a severe mood disorder my uh, entire adult life. So I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder um, when I was in my late 20s. I was actually in Asia at the time traveling, had an acute manic episode, became psychotic, somehow ended up in a jail in London, was hospitalized there, came back to the U.S., was hospitalized here, and over the next several years just had a tumultuous um, manic and suicidal um, experience while my wife and I tried to sort through all this without resources like um, are available today. So fortunately, um, meds did help us. Um, it, 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 you know, eradicated the um, extremes of bipolar disorder for me. So through my late 30s, um, I was much more stable, but I was depressed still a lot, a lot of the time. I, I keep a daily log. Um, I've done that for couple decades and I was depressed 25% um, of the time, which is really quite depressing. Until um, I discovered ketosis, which literally changed my life. And so, you know, instead of this experience where I was only energetic or creative when I was hypomanic, which was just gonna, you know, end badly, um, now I wake up alert and productive, have social and creative energy, you know, 14 hours a day, it's, it's truly um, extraordinary. And about three months or so into the ketogenic diet, um, when I first started it, I made this realization. I wasn't looking for a solution to mental health, I was just looking to boost energy and hopefully mental acuity, but that didn't really pan out. So um, <laughs> about three months into it, I made this connection that this, I think this um, eradicates mental illness. And it really did for me. It really did um, literally eradicate the symptoms of bipolar disorder for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Dr. Ian. Hi, I'm Ian Campbell. Um, I'm also diagnosed with bipolar disorder um, type 2. It's like the bad sequel to type 1. And um, I study uh, bipolar disorder. I've been working on a ketogenic diet trial for a bipolar disorder at Edinburgh University with 27 patients, and we're just about to publish the results from that. Um, I came to this because, uh, similar to MJ, I was uh, going through um, what you do with bipolar disorder, <clears throat> which is, uh, for me, it was like 80% uh, depression. So it was uh, very severe depression, suicidal depressions, and I've lost family members to mental illness. It runs in my family. My uncle uh, committed suicide with uh, two young daughters, and this was a catalyst for me to try and understand this and to try and uh, understand the condition better and to research it. And so I initially went to the bipolar community and I published a paper about five years ago looking at um, online reports uh, in the bipolar community and I found 174 people talking about this. And I thought, oh, it's not just me. Um, I discovered it by accident trying to lose weight on an Atkins diet. And for the first time in 20 years, I described it like the lights in my brain going back on for the first time. It was the first time I'd ever experienced what it felt like to be normal or to be functional. And this was a complete revelation to me. And I knew I would spend the rest of my life trying to understand this. And so my life went from trying not to jump off the fifth floor balcony of our flat, which was a real like serious mental uh, task for me for many years, trying not to commit suicide, to uh, researching and putting all my energy into this. So we've just completed a pilot trial with 27 participants. And we've shown that this happens in studies and in wider populations. And we've just surveyed 100 bipolar patients, showing that in the wider bipolar population, this is commonly reported and used. And there's very substantial reduction of symptoms. So we went to ISBD recently and played some patient testimonials uh, from this trial. And they're describing some of the things to MJ has described. This has changed the quality of my life. Uh, I'm a different person. I can function in a way that I've never been able to. So we're very excited to learn more about this. Thank you. 
And Dr. Shivani. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shivani Sethi. I'm a clinical assistant professor at Stanford, and I started uh, a metabolic psychiatry clinic, uh, clinical program, which I direct. Um, I started, I guess, my journey early in my training. I was very fortunate, uh, actually, during medical school to be exposed to ketogenic metabolic therapies um, when I was working in an obesity clinic, and I saw a treatment-resistant patient with schizophrenia improve with auditory hallucinations while on the therapy. So that really got me interested in going into psychiatry with an interest in metabolism. Uh, so from there, uh, I started eventually started a program and clinic at Stanford focusing on this metabolism and mental health connection. Um, by giving it a term, metabolic psychiatry, it brings attention, awareness, as well as, uh, well, funding. And that's been very, very helpful to, I think, accelerate the process of research and interest from clinicians in our field. So I direct uh, research trials and I do patient care with ketogenic metabolic therapies and other metabolism-based interventions. Thank you. So just based on those introductions, you can clearly see why we chose these people. They're all amazing in their own right and, and give so much to this community. But I want to start with you, Ian, because we're talking about drawing the connection between the research to the patients to make sure the research studies, and, and there are so many researchers here in the crowd and clinicians in the crowd. So how do we make sure our efforts are getting to the patient? So you sort of bridge that gap, right? You, you're on both sides of that story as the researcher and the one with lived experience. So I'm curious when you were being treated, um, where was the treatment not working as you had hoped and how do you think your research is addressing that to, to help understand treatments that can better improve people's quality of lives? So, um with bipolar disorder, the um, unfortunately, even with all the widely available access to modern treatments, the suicide rates are very high. The attempted suicide rate is 60%. So 60% of people with all the access to current treatments will try to kill themselves at least once in their life. And it's very common when you're in these bipolar support groups to see this. And you see the impairment that they have from the side effects of medications. They're not able to function. They can't think. They can't live any kind of uh, high quality of life. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's no other options made available to them. And these are kind of very heavily, um, these are kind of solutions to this problem that address very specific parts of the illness, but they don't, uh, and they compromise your metabolic health in the process. So you lose your, you gain lots of weight, you can become insulin resistant. And the side effects are so severe that many people will actually not be able to survive them. So I think when we did this trial, what we saw is that we showed that there's a treatment where you can improve people's metabolic health whilst improving their mental health. And there's a lot that makes sense about this because we've heard many talks at this conference about epilepsy and we use anti-convulsant medications to treat bipolar disorder. So we're using the same medications for these conditions. And now here's this anti-seizure intervention that's showing efficacy in bipolar disorder. And when we looked in our trial at what changed in these participants, it was the kind of markers that has been described in this conference with mitochondrial conditions, epilepsy, uh, reductions in lactate, significant reductions in brain glutamate. These are the kinds of markers that are looked at in mitochondrial disorders and epilepsy. And we saw them in our study participants significantly reducing. And we also saw a correlation between ketone level and improvements in psychiatric symptoms. So we saw that the higher the ketone level, the higher the improvement in the psychiatric symptoms. So there's definitely something, uh, a very interesting scientific puzzle here. But the, th the reason I think it will connect to patients is it empowers them to do something about their own health. They can uh, actively participate in a ketogenic diet and it's something that is, uh, their family can engage with. And it's not just taking a pill, but it's actually changing their whole lifestyle like MJ and others in this room, uh, Kayser here, who's also done this and also Hannah. Um, it, so there's actually four or five people in this conference who are actively using this as a treatment successfully. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you mentioned Hannah because I actually had a, a great discussion with Hannah earlier today and she has a, a blog post on her website that I encourage you all to read. And and she, if I can paraphrase for her, even though she's sitting right there, she says she doesn't want to call it bipolar disorder, but a metabolic brain dysfunction or a metabolic brain disorder because that, and, and one of the things that does is that gives you sort of confidence or gives you um, the ability to say, this is something I can treat. It's not a label. It's not who I am. It's not what I live with forever, but there's something with a root cause that I can, I can take 
um, the initiative to treat. And so I think that's sort of what you're what you're saying as well. And also what you had mentioned earlier today that so much of the medication is directed towards mania and the treatments for the depression side of bipolar really are sort of lacking. And maybe this is something that can fill that role. So is that something that you're seeing as well in the study? Definitely. And we just did this survey of 100 uh, people with bipolar disorder asking about their experience on a ketogenic diet. And the most substantial effect was on the depression because ketosis is improving energy metabolism. And if you look at the earliest observation of uh, psychiatrists like Emil Kreplin or John Pierre Fowlery, these were the people who wrote the diagnosis for what bipolar disorder constitutes. And they described it as an energy disorder more than 100 years ago. Uh, this was the kind of first understanding of bipolar is they saw their patients were inactive for 12 hours a day and then they would become hyperactive. And they understood it as an energy condition. And at some point we got lost in the kind of research with uh, focusing very heavily on specifics of neurotransmission. And we lost this kind of fundamental and very obvious aspect of the condition that patients recognize. Yeah, yeah. And then one thing, MJ, that you and Ian have in common is that you both sort of just stumbled upon ketosis, right? It wasn't prescribed to you. It wasn't recommended to you. You just sort of found it on your own, which is something that we hope to change by educating so many people about it. But tell us a little bit about what that was like when you when you found it, when you started it. Was there, you know, trepidation? Were you unsure if it was going to work? Were you scared that maybe you were doing the wrong thing? And how were you able to sort of stick with it? Yeah, sure. So I was looking to boost productivity and energy um, because, you know, as Ian mentioned, um, a, a lot of the treatment is around mitigating the impact of um, mania or hypomania for especially, um, if I could just say this, caregivers, because that is damaging to, you know, to, to everyone. But for me, um, I was not happy with just um, having low energy and, and not thriving the way that I used to thrive. And so I was determined to figure it out. I wasn't thinking about it in terms of mental health. I was thinking I've got to just figure out how to boost my energy. So when I discovered this, um, I was fortunate in that my wife is a wellness coach. And um, as soon as I as soon as I expressed interest, she jumped right on it because I was thinking I want energy and mental acuity. And she was thinking he needs to lose 40 pounds, um, <laughs> which which I did. Um, but she took charge. She had actually trained people in the ketogenic diet. So it was very structured. We were very strict about it. Um, and that obviously was a big Big benefit to me. I would say though that the benefits were so um, just dramatic that I would never go back. So that in itself is just really you know powerful. As far as challenges go, you know I do eat out a lot um, for work, and lunches aren't too problematic because you can have you know uh, um, meat and a vegetable and it's not a problem. But um, especially weekends, um, evenings are more problematic. So. I did discover, um, I experiment was, experimented with some things after having a um, long period of success, and I found my own sort of equilibrium around how I do the ketogenic diet. So for me, I'm in ketosis from pretty much you know Sunday evening through um, Thursday evening. And, and for, for me, what ketosis um, or the ketogenic diet is uh, 150 grams fat, 120 protein, and 30 net carbs. And then Thursday evening through Sunday, I have a very um, low carb diet, which is um, basically raising carbs to about 100 um, grams. Then also my you know overall calories go up a little bit, with a couple of like more of like what I would say a cheat meal, you know, on the weekend, like with a, a cocktail or or a dessert. Um, I rarely eat pasta or or potatoes, um, but I don't feel like it's a a sacrifice, and I and I found that with that um, cadence of how I manage being in ketosis, I experience all the benefits of of the ketogenic diet, and that's what works for me. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, certainly, probably not what we would people, what clinicians would recommend in the beginning, because you want to be consistent with it. But once you had that consistency, once you saw that benefit, then you were able to self-experiment and kind of find what works for you. And I, I think that's a good example that it doesn't have to look one way. And especially when, you know, here in the epilepsy world, we, we talk about the four to one ketogenic diet and, and it doesn't have to look that way, right? We learned from Dr. Kossoff's work that the modified Atkins diet can work for epilepsy. Well, it's the same from a from a mental health standpoint that there can be different versions that work for different people as long as 
presumably we're achieving ketosis and, and Ian, like your study showed with higher ketone levels tracking with, with better mood symptoms. So, so Dr. Sethi, I want to bring you in here as well, because obviously you've had your trial and we're talking about how um, the research study really impacts clinical practice. So I'm curious for you as the researcher and the clinician seeing the patient in front of you every day, how do you, how do you think about that when you're thinking about your research and designing the research to say, how am I going to impact clinical practice? Yeah, that's a good question. So I give you a little bit of context behind the reason why this was an exploratory study looking both at metabolic outcomes as well as psychiatric. So my interest was, I practice obesity medicine and psychiatry, and a lot of patients that get referred to me have metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and have pretty severe BMIs. So a lot of times they're on psychotropic medications that have metabolic side effects and they get off their medications sometimes because they are not happy with the weight gain that they've had also. And so one of my interests in designing this study, this is before uh, I met the uh, Bazooki Foundation, uh, one of my interests was looking at, well, can patients with schizophrenia and bipolar who have such high rates of metabolic syndrome and metabolic abnormalities compared to the general population, and often it gets mis not diagnosed or treated. Um, and we already know the rates in general population are pretty high, so this is a particularly vulnerable group. And my interest was looking at, well, is there going to be a change in this population that are on drugs, on these drugs? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, which is great. Um, with the psychiatric outcomes, there were improvements in all directions. So what we did was a ketogenic uh, therapy in those with schizophrenia or bipolar for a four-month duration uh, pilot study. So this was all exploratory, and it was very promising. Yeah, and it is really interesting how you can come at this from two different ways. You can say, let's look at ketosis and how it impacts uh, the, the psychiatric symptoms. Or you could also say, let's look at ketosis and how it impacts the side effects or the adverse effects from the psychiatric medications. And either way, it's sort of like all, all roads sort of lead to the same position. And that's what you saw in your study, not only the metabolic improvements, and, but the also psychiatric improvements together. So do you think that this can be, I don't want to use the word marketed, but sort of like promoted or discussed with clinicians in, in either way? Like, oh, you can use this to sort of combat some of the uh, antipsychotic weight gain or... Um, also to treat the psychiatric symptoms. Do you think either way would be sort of amenable to, to practicing clinicians? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think the answer to that is yes, yeah. because both the pilot did answer both of those things, which is a really beneficial thing because clinicians also have interest in both aspects of it. And ultimately, the the outcomes were showing improvements in both directions. So that, that helps with um, with feeling comfortable yeah. With adopting a, a different a different treatment. Yeah. Very good. And, and now Nicole. Now, we often hear oh, ketogenic is just ketogenic diet is so difficult to do. It's so restrictive, right? And don't get me started on that. How can anybody else tell you what's too hard to do? But I mean, we have to be honest. People who are living with psychiatric symptoms and maybe who aren't sort of the same from one day to the other to make significant lifestyle changes and dietary changes requires some support. And that's something that you are an expert at doing. So what have you found that people can, where they really sort of need support, both in, in the everyday world, but also how it could apply to someone in a clinical trial, where someone designing a clinical trial, what should they think about, about how to support people going through this transition? Yeah, so it's uh, you guys are all very well versed in in putting people on ketogenic diets at various levels of of in a disease process and disability. So um, getting caregivers on board if if someone has a caregiver now not everybody has a great caregiver or a great support system and they still want and need to do the ketogenic diet or want to try it as a treatment. Um, and so when you're dealing with people with mental illness, it not maybe in a trial and, and maybe not, um, there can be extra emotional support that's, that's required. And so you as that support person becomes very important to them. Uh, you can help them problem solve in ways that they didn't think of or couldn't think of on their own. They're on a lot of medications and sometimes their brain doesn't work that great on all those medications. A lot of psychiatric 
uh, diagnoses have really profound cognitive issues. And because of the way our medical system is where we've decided there's neurology and there's psychiatry, that doesn't get kind of considered well enough. Um, so I've had people that I've transitioned to a ketogenic diet that were in a, a, a very difficult depression. And we had a meal, we started a meal service, you know, just the same types that they use for fitness, right? Um, that's where we started or we said, okay, can we get out and get some eggs and some beef and some tallow and some butter, you know, you guys know. Um, and you just start really, you start really small. And, um, so that's in the beginning and a lot of people get great benefit and they feel a lot better. And then there's the processing that happens. Um, a lot of people were sick for a really long time and tried to get help and went to therapy every, every week. You know, I, I have this diagnosis. I need to go to therapy every week. And it's kind of funny because as they get better, they look at me like, I don't have anything to talk about. I'm doing really well. And I'm like, I know, just tell me about how you're doing really well. Let's talk about that, you know? And that's part of their processing because when they have these diagnoses, I don't care how many times we tell them you're not your symptoms, you're not your symptoms, they end up internalizing their symptoms as they're who they are and what they're capable of. And so, you know, there can be a lot of anger and sadness about lost time, lost relationships, lost jobs, lost education opportunities. A lot of these serious mental illnesses strike when people are at their prime, ready to figure out who they are and what they're capable of, right? It's an important developmental period. And so um, that, I think that is an important part of support. Yeah. Um, not everybody has great relationships and you change in a relationship, you know, any family systems therapist knows this, you change something in the relationship, there's adjustments that have to happen in that relationship. People have roles and suddenly they're not needed in that role. And, you know, uh, so people like stories, should I tell a story? Sure, please. <laughs> so, um, well, that's what everyone tells me, uh, tell me a story. There was a, a gentleman that I worked with who, um, he, you know, their thing was they liked to go to bars and they had lots of friends at bars and that was great. But um, it was it was his wife was embarrassed that he wouldn't eat the, you know, she understood why she got it. But it was the end of an era for for this way that she connected with him, you know, having the fried things and playing darts and 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 having fun with with friends that way. And it caused an issue in their marriage. And I'm glad that he had me to support him through that thing because, you know, she was like, I'm out of here. You're boring now. So um, that's a story. I, you know, I also worked with this woman with bipolar disorder. She came to me unmedicated because she said she couldn't tolerate the medications. And she was almost constantly, I think, in a state of hypomania. And she was not working. And, you know, why are you not working? Well, because when I work, I don't, I don't stop working. I just go, go, go. And I neglect my family and my husband and my children. And I can't trust myself to work. And so we put her, she was, and she did not come to me for a ketogenic diet. I, you know, work in Washington and I take insurance. So I get a little bit of everybody, you know, she came to me for therapy. Um, and I told her about the ketogenic diet and we, we got her going on it. And she stabilized and that, you know, and she went out and, and stopped seeing me because she got a job and the hours didn't work out, logistics. And then I didn't see her for a long time. And she, she contacted me and said, I really need to see you. And so I got her in and, and she was very, very upset. And what had happened is at her new job, you know, they all went to Starbucks and there was a treat and she had a treat, you know, and uh, went into mania and did not make that connection. And, and even after she came back to see me, um, you know, we came out in conversation. I said, you ate what? You had what? You know, and she said, well, that wouldn't do it, would it? Right? And so this is someone who had been on a ketogenic diet, stabilized, went out into the world, you know, having a handle on it. And she ended up having an affair. And she came in with great shame and embarrassment. And it, these people need emotional support past three months. Yeah. So 
that's my two cents about it. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. You know, life goes on and, and frequently someone with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia has some burn bridges and has some challenges in life that, that, you know, they didn't mean to do, but happened. So just starting a diet isn't going to fix all that. And so that's where they need to sort of process it. But there's good stories too. (laughs) (laughs) There's good stories too. I get to have conversations with people, not just about like, can you shower today? I get to have conversations with people like, Hey, you're good. You're applying to that graduate program that you couldn't get into 10 years ago. Stuff like that. So it's not, it's, it's, it helps. It's just helpful to have an extra support. Yeah. So, so Dr. Seth, I mean, you, you've done your, your pilot trial and you're, you know, looking to design other trials. So if if someone was looking to start uh, a ketogenic intervention trial, would you have advice about what kind of support the patients in the subjects in the trial need to help ensure success? Yeah, I think this is a very good question because especially with this serious mental illness, the population, it's like Nicole was saying, the emotional support is very important. And when you first meet the patient, I think it's really important to understand what frame of mind they're in, um, how severe their illness is, what kind of supports they may have at home uh, or resources. It's, it's incredibly valuable to know that information up front and to have a conversation with them about what that looks like. Also, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation is also important. A lot of the f- folks that started uh, in the study, they, they never were on a ketogenic diet before they entered the study. So it's a whole learning and behavioral change for them uh, during, during the study itself. Um, I'm going to raise your hand if you were the type of person that got A's because they wanted to please their teacher or their parent. Oh, okay. We don't have that many of them are. (laughs) So maybe this group is a little bit more intrinsically motivated. (laughs) Uh, So understanding where your patient is, if they have intrinsic or extrinsic motivation is also really important um, going into the study. So I spent a lot of time with each person in particular, educating them, understanding who they are. And I could do that because it was a pilot trial. Uh, when it's a larger trial, then there'll probably be a little bit more um, challenge to that. But I still think it's really worth the time um, and energy to spend doing that. Um, you know, we can have re- heavily rely on our dietitians too. Um, but I think it's really important to have that therapeutic alliance. So that goes along with support, the the feeling that they know that they can contact you if they have questions, or is there a support group maybe as part of the study um, or the trial that they can have other peers maybe to ask questions or not feel like alone in the journey um, or understand what kinds of things they may expect uh, that they're gonna go through in terms of change regarding their psychiatric health, um, what kinds of factors, you know, or things I've seen. So I, I was able to share that with them. And I think that was particularly helpful for them. Uh, so I would say all of that is important as a springboard for the clinical trial. It's actually very helpful for them to be part of the trial because they get all that support initially. Post trial, the question there becomes, uh, you know, what happens after that? And I think it also depends on what their goals are and understanding where they want to go and um, you know, obviously looking at their labs and seeing objectively what are the things that have actually changed for them. Um, and that motivates them too. So a lot of the patients in my study are still my patients um, because I gave that as an option to them that they weren't just going to be left behind after the trial. And I think that was also particularly helpful. And I was fortunate to have that to give them as an option because of the metabolic psychiatry um, clinic that that we have. So yeah, that's really powerful. Not just you're done with the study, see you later. But like, yeah, you can we're gonna walk you through this and keep keep supporting you. Yeah, that's so important. Well, I can certainly sit here and just keep asking you guys questions for hours, but nobody wants that. I wanna open it up to all of you if anybody else has questions to to Hi, really enjoy that. What do you think are the parallels between mental health and epilepsy in how the ketogenic diet is used and how can we learn from each other? Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's so interesting because we use anticonvulsants to treat bipolar disorder, uh, and now we have obviously this other anti-seizure intervention for uh, this showing efficacy for bipolar disorder. So, what are the common mechanisms? And, and one of the things we saw in our pilot trial 
was we did MRS um, brain scans of all our participants, and we saw that the elevated glutamate is a feature of bipolar disorder established in systematic review. It's a very well established um, alteration that you see in bipolar, and we saw that come down significantly in our participants. And so this is really fascinating to me because this is a kind of marker you see in epilepsy studies, um, and we're seeing this also in bipolar. And if you look at the serum lactate levels, like you'd see in mitochondrial disorders and in some forms of epilepsy, we saw that reduce in our participants as well. And elevated lactate is the most elevated serum biomarker in bipolar disorder. So the most altered brain biomarker is glutamate, the most elevated uh, serum biomarker is lactate, and both those are relevant to epilepsy and bipolar and are affected by ketogenic diet. So I think this is one of the most interesting scientific questions I could think of if you were studying bipolar disorder. And I've published some papers about this recently if anyone's interested to read more about it. Thank you. Over here, yeah. Hi there guys, how you doing, Dorian? Um, I got a, a, a multifaceted question. Uh, in um, drug-resistant epilepsy in an adult population, uh, they had about a, 40, uh, a 35 to 46% adherence rate. Then in Brighton, when Dr. Hallberg spoke about the Verta study, they, using the continuous remote care model versus an episodic method of care, they achieved like a 64% acceptance rate. So when you're working with bipolar patients, what sort of a, uh, adherence rates are you getting? Um, do testing ketones matter? And do ketone levels actually matter? Is it the way that you are working with those patients gets you better adherence? Yeah. I think I'll, I'll take this question. So in the pilot study that we did, we actually separated out the data from those who were adherent versus semi-adherent and looked at the outcomes. Um, both had positive outcomes. Uh, I would say for adherence rates, to answer your question with, with our you know, pilot, um, I would say over, yeah, over 80% were adherent. Um, and there was, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. There was one uh, that was non-adherent um, and the remainder were um, semi-adherent. And the way that we defined semi-adherence was if you were, uh, we, we did ketone readings actually weekly and then measured it out to whether they were in the 0.5 to 5 range. And if they were 80% uh, of the time and above, they were adherent and below that between uh, 60 to 80 they were semi-adherent, anything below that was considered non-adherent. So I do think that it was it was helpful to know um, what the adherence kind of category was for them and seeing what the data showed according to those groups was really helpful because we did see greater, um, across the board and in, in general, we did see greater improvements with, with adherence versus semi-adherence. And how about you, Ian? How often were they checking ketones in your trial? So we were checking uh, daily, actually, with the meter that you make with the Ikita Mojo, and uh, they were sending in the results, and they were 91% adherent, which is defined as over 0 0.5 millimolar ketosis, which was great. And um, I kind of myth buster in terms of that people with mental illness can stick to this diet. Um, and, and we also plotted the trajectory of their ketone levels and their symptoms uh, from their daily measurements. And you can see a very clear, and you'll see this in the paper that we're about to publish, an adaption period of about 14 days where their mood improves, their energy improves, their anxiety reduces, and it tracks, uh, it kind of co-varies with the ketone level, which I think is fascinating because it indicates, like you say, that there's something about ketones and the level of ketones that's significant in the symptom reduction. Uh, so very interesting. So MJ, when you were starting out, did you test your ketones? Was it something you tracked or did you just kind of go by, you know, set the macros and go? No, I test. Uh, I tested then. I test today, every yeah. day, every morning. So yes, when I am uh, um, fully adhering to the ketogenic diet, I am, you know, one. I'm point seven to, you know, one plus. And then on the, you know, Thursday through Saturday into Sunday, more typically, uh, you know, point two to point four. Mm -hmm. But I'm always in that range. And interestingly. Um, I can replicate this experiment in my own life, and if I go completely out of ketosis um, for a period of time, I get sluggish, don't have ideas, don't want to be around people. So uh, I will say that it um, is very correlated in my in my own life. I can reproduce that uh, impact. And Nicole, do you find it a motivating factor, like accountability and motivation? Well, yeah, it, it's a 
it's a behavioral modification tool, really. Um, you know whether you adhere to the diet or not, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're making ketones or not. And, it, and it's funny because people are like, oh, I'm doing it right. This should be working. And then they get kind of motivated to like figure it out with you, figure out what's, what's in the way. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's helpful and I think it, it, it helps their, helps them understand this is a medical diet. Like, mm. you know, just like if you had diabetes and you were going to test your glucose, you're doing a medical diet. This is, this is your treatment. And so of course we're going to measure this because we wouldn't just can't throw a bunch of pills at you and say, well, you know, try to take the right amount, right? I mean, try to see if you're going to do it right. right. This, is, this is a medical prescription. And I think that helps them take it seriously. And I think that measuring those ketone levels helps them understand that better. Well said. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think it was wonderful. Um, I'm one as well. I'm a neurologist. I work on metabolism. I'm also a laboratory scientist. And we also do clinical trials. Uh, and my question is not so much for you as for everybody else, and it's a very uh, difficult question. And, and my question is, uh, why exactly do you feel the need uh, to do a clinical trial? And, and I'll, ex I'll explain. I, I have no reason to doubt or to question what you said about yourself and yourself. I get it. I understand it. I believe it. I know. You know what I know. We all agree. Um, if I run a clinical trial and you set me up to run a clinical trial and I conclude 80% efficacy, 50% efficacy, 10% efficacy, 99% efficacy, what does it matter to you? Can we put you in touch with the head of the APA? I guess you have a discussion. <laughs> yeah. So why do we need clinical trials? I think that's a great question. Sometimes I grapple with that myself um, because I see patients get better and that's very rewarding. Um, but I think for adoption and for it to be adopted by a wider uh, group, um, I think the evidence needs to be there for that. Um, in the field of psychiatry, we have the Mediterranean diet has been studied in depression and has been accepted as you know, a treatment, um, it would be great if the ketogenic diet could also similarly be considered a tool. Uh, but but so, what, what's wrong with what you do with just do, using it and benefiting people and helping people? I can why, answer why, that. why do you have this paradigm <laughs> that you have to comply with this structure? And this is a paradigm as of today. I understand. I mean, we, we do I do clinical trials, so I understand what you do, what you're trying. But you know, why exactly do you have to agree to everything you're told you should be doing? <laughs> yes. Sorry, I, I caused a problem, probably. <laughs> but I, just... I, I sat by you before the dance party. I know you. You're an instigator. So, <laughs> so uh, the way I think of it, I'm not a researcher, and I probably shouldn't be answering this question. But for, for me, I, I know that there are hoops that must be jumped through for this to be standard of care. And the vision I have for this is that someone, someone has, you know, has an episode and this is offered as standard of care. This is one of the options that is given. And I think that all the hoops and all the T's need to be crossed and all the I's have to be dotted in order for that to be a reality. I see people suffer decades unnecessarily because this is not standard of care. So if we, if, if these brilliant researchers need to jump through all the hoops to make this available to people as a first option, then I think whatever it takes. Just to follow up on Nicole's um, comments. I have a shared vision. I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I also feel that in order for it to be adopted by uh, clinical practice, um, it also needs to be reimbursed. Um, payers have to pay for it. <laughs> Otherwise, clinicians are not going to spend their time um, on this. And so I think that's why the studies are important also. I, I agree with all those points. And, and to build on it from a patient perspective, 
you know, people with mental illness are very vulnerable. Uh, they, they can't have as much say in their own treatment and they don't have as much agency in their own treatment. And throughout the years, uh, psychiatry has always tried to address it in the best way and you how with the best scientific understanding and you how. But sometimes that worked out very badly for patients like the era of insulin shock therapy where there was wards of hundreds of patients being put into comas and this was considered standard of care. And in every generation where there's been uh, treatments that were very severe for patients and unhelpful for patients, it was the randomized controlled trials that pulled us out of those years. So every time we went into a dark age of psychiatry, like insulin shock or trepanation or lobotomies, it was always the randomized controlled trials that was standing in the patient's corner and saying, this is what we really need. So it's a very powerful way for patients to stand up for their own care because they can point to that and it stands in the history of the scientific record as something that patients can look to. So I think it's a very powerful way that patients can find uh, better treatments, but there is necessary, but not sufficient. We need randomized controlled trials, but it needs to be also translated to patient care uh, through the methods that you're describing, uh, through uh, subsidizing those uh, interventions. But, but it's an excellent question because if someone is living with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and major depression now, or someone's family member is, they don't need the randomized control trials to try it, right? They can learn from your experience, and that's why we're talking about it as the randomized control trials are catching up. But you're absolutely right. For right now, they, they wouldn't need it to say, I want to see if this works for me. I think that is a great point. We have other questions over here. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a fantastic discussion. Um, I'm Ingrid Sheffer. I'm a pediatric and adult epileptologist from Australia, and I run a keto program. Um, I'm... Um, it's been very interesting about bipolar disorder, but far more of my patients have mild depression, just common, common garden depression. Does, does it work for that? That's question number one. Second question, slightly more out of left field, my paediatric unit has a major interest in eating disorders. Seems somewhat weird to be giving girls predominantly that won't eat high-fat diet. Can someone explain that to me? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I'll, t I'll take this one. So I was trained in eating disorders too, and that has been one interest of mine as well, is looking at um, low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets and eating disorders. So I'm working on something, but I did publish a case series of uh, patients that actually improved on um, a ketogenic uh, therapy with the eating disorder symptoms. So that included bulimia and binge eating, not anorexia specifically. The case series was focused on bulimia and binge eating. Um, you know, there are a lot of different theories as, as to why we think that might be helpful. Um, definitely having a higher fat diet um, can be helpful with, you know, the brain, you need, you need myelin. Um, a lot of the Patients with eating disorders have a, are on a low-fat sort of dietary approach and probably not having adequate amounts of fat. Um, so that's probably you know one one point. Um, and then you had asked about depression. But actually, real quick, so yeah, well, we should talk get to a question about depression. 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 But, but to follow up on the on the eating disorder question, actually, I mean. We, I've been fortunate enough to interview a number of experts in some of the room, Dr. Guido Frank, Dr. Laurie Calabresi, and um, there, and there, there, and uh, Beth and Denise also, and and to hear some of the patient stories who have used a ketogenic diet to treat their anorexia, and now it's being studied in an organized way. And there are two ways to look at at at, at the ketogenic diet. I mean, is it a weight loss diet? Or is it a medical intervention that changes the metabolism, the chemistry of your brain, and can be done in a way that does not promote weight loss, but actually weight stabilization? Uh, because you're eating whole foods, you're eating the proteins and the fats that you've been avoiding for so long, and do it in a way that changes your brain chemistry and metabolism, where all of a sudden you can address the psychiatric side of the eating disorder. So it, it's definitely early, um, but very promising from what a lot of the experts in this room are, are, are learning and practicing. And then depression. Yeah, so a lot of other other experts in this room to, to ask about eating disorders. My only comment about the depression is that in our study, we did look at depression, but within the context of those with schizophrenia and bipolar, and depression improved by 50% in the adherent group um, and 10% in the, in the semi-adherent group. So uh, there are other studies underway where um, people are looking at ketogenic therapy and, and depression, but I think we're still waiting for results. Yeah, there's one study at Ohio State being done sort of as we speak specifically on depression. So it'll be very exciting to see see the results of that. Yes, sir, who looks vaguely familiar over there in the corner. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I was, I have two questions. For those of you who have 
You it's a very weird way to talk to people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, you have used the ketogenic diet for your own you know, symptom, reverse one for your patients, uh, Shabani, in your trial. Does the improvement happen, do they feel the improvement happens gradually? Or is there sort of a day or a moment where you suddenly the sky is clear and you feel like that they're your patients feel like this is, things have just gotten better. I mean, I know with other conditions, sometimes it's, it's within a day you can feel that this has been resolved. And then my other question for Ian and Chibani is, what kind of buy-in have you gotten from your colleagues in your institution as you're getting beneficial results? Do you feel that it's disseminating or do you feel that you're still living in a bubble? <laughs> So, MJ, let's start with you. What was your personal experience in terms of the time frame of, of seeing benefit? The clouds parted, and uh, it was instantaneous. Wow. <laughs> How about you, Ian? Um, yeah, the first week that I went on it, I knew something had really changed, but there was a continuing improvement from there on. Uh, and in our uh, participants in our trial, you can, you can see in their psychiatric readings, they track with ketone levels going up and there's, a and there's an improvement over 14 days, but often they notice it within three or four. So um, a bunch of people said to me, within three or four days, you know, it's like a fog lifted or like the lights came back on, that sort of thing. But there's, yeah, varied responses. Um, so in my experience with my patients, normally they reported improvements after the keto adaptation period. Um, so after two, three weeks post starting the ketogenic diet, they would tell me about major changes. And then there were people also that noticed things later, a um, month or even two months later. So I had a variability. And then what about buy-in from your, from your colleagues? Yeah, so as far as... <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. I don't mind that you asked me that. <laughs> um, you know, it's mixed. There, there are colleagues that are very supportive, um, and there are colleagues that are skeptical, and I think that's that just that comes with um, human nature. Um, my institution, though, I think has been been pretty supportive um, overall, at, at least with the leadership. They've been pretty supportive of metabolic psychiatry, so I'm very fortunate for that. Um. And initially, I went around a whole bunch of uh, psychiatrists around the UK, and, and nobody would support this or take an interest in it. This was about six years ago. And I found one person who did, who is uh, called Daniel Smith. He's a professor of psychiatry. He was at Glasgow University, not even the university I'm at. So I started working with him, and uh, he was very, very skeptical about it. But he said, let's give it a try. And then over time, he's seen uh, in our pilot trial the results. And this has made a huge shift in our department. He gave a presentation to the Royal College of Psychiatrists, which is the governing body of psychiatrists in the UK, uh, last week. And he was saying the thing that he was surprised by is how open people are to this because they're struggling with treatments. They see the side effects, the weight gain. People are looking for better tools. It's like a kind of army with uh, you know weapons that are 20, 30 years old. And they're looking for new and more effective tools to use. So I think there's actually a great demand for this uh, to have approaches that address this metabolic dysfunction and side effects. And so we might see more acceptance of this than you would anticipate from the academic and psychiatric community. Last two questions, I agree. Thank you for a great discussion. Um, I, I just wonder, in epilepsy, when we do ketogenic diet uh, in patients, uh, we have quite a few non-responders, people who actually do not have any effect of the treatment. Um, and now, uh, listening to you, it sounds like everybody are responding. Is that correct? or? Do you have non-responders? There are there are non-responders too. I think you know ultimately when you take the average um, in the data, overall there shows improvements because the people who've improved improved a lot. Um, but there are some people who who did not respond. Um, or they didn't get worse, but yeah. But how how can you assure that, or how how do you find out how long do they? go on the diet before you conclude that they are non-responding? Yeah, that's a good question. For, for, for our study, it was four months in duration. So I think, you know, usually with antidepressant treatment or other um, clinical trials in psychiatry, we have 12 weeks, usually minimum. 
All right, and our, our final question. Thank you. Um, from me, it's going to be a little bit of a different question. I, uh, I am a person that's treating uh, their brain metabolism disorder undiagnosed with a ketogenic diet successfully, thanks to Beth and the Charlie Foundation. And, uh, and my question is about one of my relatives, my son, who has similar symptoms, but you know how he treats his disorder with alcohol. He is an alcoholic, uh, very actively so. And so I'm, I'm wondering if your organization is branching out into finding out how that is related, you know? If it's possible to treat alcoholism uh, with a ketogenic diet. That's my question. Good and question. it's a challenge, actually. Yeah, for sure. There's, a, there's an RC, an excellent RCT that was done by the National Institute of Alcohol and Drug Abuse where they found that it had amazing effects on withdrawal syndrome. So the people who um, were the people who were using the ketogenic diet, they needed less benzodiazepines and they had less alcohol cravings. And this was a particularly impressive study because they also had a, a animal arm of the of the study, and they also showed a reduction in brain inflammation um, through uh, fMRI. So uh, I think that I think that it would be a great thing to study for treatment centers for sure. But that's just my thought. Yeah. Okay. Now, really, the last question. <laughs> What's you your experience with the use of exogenous ketones in mental health? Do they have a role? The exogenous ketones? ketones yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, I, I mean, I can start. There's, there's this, you know, kind of ongoing question. Is it is it the nutrition and the metabolic health that also provides ketones, or is it the ketones themselves? And and I know studies are being designed to answer that question, so I'm not sure we know the answer, but I'm curious if you have sort of opinions based on your clinical practice, Shivani, or, or from your personal experiences. Yeah, in clinical practice, I'd say I, I don't see exogenous ketones affecting uh, mental health as much as the you know, true ketogenic metabolic therapy um, endogenously. So that's that's my opinion. I do think that there may be a place for exogenous ketones um, in, in some aspects, but with bipolar and schizophrenia particularly, I haven't seen that being helpful. It's, so, so, uh, so what do you think that there, that, that there are some people who can't adhere to a diet. So some people have the difficulty. So, if, so, so do you think, can those people be on the exogenous ketones? People who can't, can't adhere to the diet. So like as a supplementary, yes. yeah. I think that might, might be something that could be helpful, but I, you know, like it probably needs to be studied and I don't know that I have as much clinical experience with that. I, I, I guess I would just add anecdotally from speaking to uh, patients that people can experience a uh, reduction of symptoms in 30 to 45 minutes of taking a ketone supplement. So I've spoken to a number of people, myself included, when you take MCT all, you can really notice if you're in a very severe depressive episode, if you take MCT all, you can feel the difference within 30 to 45 minutes. And this is one of the things that first convinced me about this working. So the, the diet is the best standard to just adhere to the diet is the best way to do it. Um, but there is something interesting about ketone supplementation. I think there's a lot to be learned there and, and researched. I think that as far as insulin resistance and changing those metabolic aspects, uh, would be a lot harder with exogenous ketones, and you know that's not going to affect it as much. Yeah, but then Ian, like in your study, how you how you mentioned the the mood improvement tracked with ketone levels. So maybe if somebody could only get to a 0.8 with a keto diet, then maybe supplementing them to get to a two. Obviously, hypothetically speaking, but that could be another way to use ketone supplements. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with, um, you know, there's, there's no replacement for the diet. That is the fundamental improvement in insulin resistance. But getting people, we did see this threshold of, in the ketone levels where around two millimolar, people are having much uh, be- much more benefits than below two millimolar. Yeah. And that's been seen in some epilepsy studies, maybe four millimolar for children. As some And one, one study certainly is a threshold. So I think, yeah, if you could use to get people into those higher ranges, that could be a really good use for it. And it could actually be a really important research point that could be missed is, is not getting those higher ketone ranges. So I, I think more research into exogenous ketones, the better. Yeah. And exogenous ketones or MCT oil, as you know, Dr. Mary Newport and her, and her, and her journey and her story has, has taught us about. So yeah, lots of options. Well, I want to thank the panel very much. Thank you for, for joining us and for all your wisdom. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay.